Hello, hello everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar on Asset Journey. We'll be showing you the Asset Journey program and how it solves the asset management problems at retirement homes and aged care villages, aged care centers, I mean, <clears throat> and uh, how it meets the requirements of the New South Wales legislation, which we believe is going to, that legislation, legislative mandates are going to spread out to the other states, especially Queensland and Victoria. So uh, we'll be, you'll be preparing yourself quite well for upcoming legislative mandates, as well as helping keep better track of your assets and managing your operations better using Asset Journey. So we're very glad to show you this. My name is Scott Riskibo. I'm up in California here at 6 p.m. in case you're wondering on the day before on a Tuesday. Nice weather. Aiden's down there in Sydney with you guys in New South Wales. He's the CFO of Toolage Communities who run four villages. Aiden and I got together some time ago, uh, I think a couple of years now, and uh, built Path of Journey based on what we already had at Crow Canyon Software. Crow Canyon Software has been around 25 years building applications for businesses of all sizes. And uh, then <clears throat> Aiden got in touch with us and we adapted our asset management program to be Asset Journey and it's been quite successful and adopted by a number of villages throughout New South Wales and, and other, other states also in Australia. So we're quite uh, quite glad to show it to you. Uh, it's it's AMP, you know, a asset management plan. It's like AM. It stands for AMP stands for that. It runs on all the different devices. We made it so it runs on the desktop, tablets, and mobile, uh, so it can meet the needs of your if your uh, workforce is remote or you know wandering around the village or whatever, using mobile devices. So here's here's what happened in New South Wales. Some of you may be aware of this. So. Um, but I'll go through it anyway, of course, uh, the mandate to have an AMP in place by July 1st. Well, of course, that passed already. So uh, now the fair trading is doing some audits and even issuing some fines uh, from what we hear, you know, the, what we've heard with air on the ground. So it's never too late to get this going. <clears throat> it's Even if it's passed to July 1st, it's required by these Retirement Villages Acts. It applies to New South Wales, especially right now, but we, it's likely to apply to other states soon. Uh, and we see already movement in the legislatures there to to uh, have the same kind of pass, same kind of legislation passed, uh, something similar. And we feel Asset Journey can adapt to whatever legislation comes out that may be particular to Queensland or particular to Victoria. We think it'll be fairly similar to what's in New South Wales, but every state's a little different and they may have different requirements. But Asset Journey is very flexible and we, we're not worried about being able to adapt it easily for the specific requirements of that particular state. Now, in New South Wales and probably in the other states, the asset management plan needs to have an asset register. In New South Wales, it's everything $1,000 and above. That's called major items of capital. But of course, in our system, you could record all your assets, anything you want. It doesn't have to be just the ones 1000 and above. And we made the reporting so that if you do need to run a report that is for legislative purposes on asset register, you can isolate it just the ones 1000 and above, major items of capital to meet the legislative requirements, but if you want other reports for basic management of assets throughout your organization, then you can also run reports on that. So you can go either way. If you just want it for to meet the mandates, major items of capital, $1,000 and above, or all your assets, uh, we can, we, you know, the asset journey can handle both. And then we, from that asset register and from the system, the, the task and the uh, asset database that we have, we generate maintenance schedules that are both actual and estimated. Three are reports for capital maintenance and expenditures, and Aiden will be able to go into this in more detail. Of course, reports have to be available to residents for review, and that's one of the key components of the legislation is to have these reports ready for scrutiny, not only by residents, but also by auditors and uh, let, you know government, government tribunals and everything. So it's really just <clears throat> keeping everybody on the up and up, I suppose as far as uh, assets go. So like I said, any major item capital above that $1,000 Australian and more, uh, registered must include the effective life of the asset. Well, that's from the ATO tables. Uh, we can give you links to that and uh, how to find like what's the effective life of a refrigerator, dishwasher, or whatever. And if the assets are shared, the percentages must be attributed, attributed correctly, maybe 100% because you don't have uh, any share or it could be 50-50 or whatever. And um, here's one thing in New South Wales, a operators cannot charge residents for maintenance or repairs of a major item of capital if the item is not listed in the asset register. So obviously that's quite, 
quite important to uh, have it listed there. Maintenance schedule, get the details of maintaining and replacing the major items of capital. Uh, there's information about planned maintenance, repairs, replacement activities. Look, we all know it gets a little bit um, hard to know what you're going to spend five years from now on maintaining something, but we, you know, you do your best, you put in there, that's why it's called estimated, and uh, there are some historical information you can go by that will help guide what those numbers should be, and if they're not 100% accurate, that's, you know, nobody's going to hold you to it until uh, the time comes, or if it's way off mark or something, um, so... But of course, the existing cost of the item, you know, the you you have in in your uh, record somewhere, we imagine, and uh, that can get put in. Uh, we can talk about all those details, but um, believe me, we've worked with a number of villages. Aiden's very very up on this. He knows all the laws and legislation. He's a great great resource if you need any questions about the details. There's a lot of minutia, you know, when you get down into it, and. Uh, Fortunately, we're really up on it. We built Asset Journey for the uh, specific purpose of meeting these legislative mandates, and uh, we know we know it in and out. Uh, we've read the guidelines numerous times and built our program to match what's required there. Okay, then there's a three-year report of capital maintenance, where each asset has estimated uh, an estimate of the cost dates and type of proposed repairs and proposed maintenance. This is PM and RM, what we call PM is prevent. Uh, no, preventative maintenance and reactive maintenance. I guess we can call it reactive. So we put those in there. Uh, assets, you got to know in the three-year report, which assets are within one year of effective life and which ones have uh, accumulated cost of repairs that is nine, greater than 90% of the purchase price. This is setting that up so those assets can be replaced if they're within one year of effective life and if they cost uh, greater than 90% of the purchase price. So that's setting it up that in the three-year report, you have every right to replace it. Uh, for that reason, there has to be an independent assessment of the AMP by a, a quantity surveyor or auditor, must meet the requirements of uh, regulation. And everything, everyone we've had gone through the independent assessment has passed using Asset Journey. So we're very confident that, you know, once we get your system in place, it will pass the audit. We can't guarantee it, but we are very confident it will. And the residents have 60 days to review and comment. <clears throat> and the thing is about this. We built in our program a resident feedback capability so that if residents do have comments, their feedback is recorded and the legislation actually actually requires uh, the operator to uh, record not only the feedback, but what action was taken on that feedback. Did you act on it, not act on it? Was it irrelevant? Was it something, you know, the resident feedback is not just just there for, you know, purpose, is that you have to react to it and respond to it and ask the journey has the capability to record the feedback and record your response to that feedback. <clears throat> so that's really quite a comprehensive program, you know, I have to admit. Um, must be The AMP must be kept up to date. So once you get it in place, you get it going, you get it launched, well, then it's, it's I wouldn't say easy, but e much, much easier because then you only have to uh, update it when there's a major item of capital purchase or there's maintenance <clears throat> or there the total estimated costs are likely increased by 25% or more. In other words, it's not set and forget. There is ongoing maintenance, ongoing um, care that has to be given to keep the asset register up, up to date. We, we make it easy with Asset Journey because you can just have a maintenance task and record the task when it's done. You know if it's PM or RM, how much it costs, and then it's automatically uh, entered into the asset register and the, uh, the uh, reports are accurately uh, in there. Now, as far as how to prepare an AMP, <clears throat> well, this guide, we've been through this so much, you know, we do it, every village is different, let's put it that way, and we're able to adapt to whatever the needs are. Some people have their, some villages have their assets very well recorded, others have to go out and sort of go room by room and count them. It depends if your village has been around a while or it's new, how old the uh, components in the uh, individual units are. And, and, and you'll know that personally, and we really, that's where we like to have the one-on-one -on -one conversations, do a demo, figure it out with you. Now, first thing, ter determine what system you will use. And I always make a joke here, that's easy, you're going to use Asset Journey, right? So, but that's, that's uh, you know, of course, up to you what, how, what direction you go in. So you have to have a system, you have to capture the asset da data, import it in, and then pair a maintenance schedule and keep uh, make sure you keep the system going, uh, the, you know, your asset register and your AMP up to date like i said when you purchase a new app, a new uh major item of, of capital or you do repairs or you know other things so our amp our asset journey in fact we even call it out just plain asset journey 
meets all the legislative requirements, plus you include all the assets, not just major items of capital. We have maintenance tasks, we have import templates, it's highly customizable, integrates with third-party systems. One partner we're working with recently is a resident portal called Compago. Uh, we were just uh, talking to them just the other day and getting that going. It's mobile friendly and runs on Office 365. Now, if you don't have your own Office 365, we can provide a hosted version that is, uh, is uh, easy to subscribe to. We also offer a work order option um, for a comprehensive management of, you know, if you want a full maintenance work order, more than just simply tracking tasks, you want to go into the, the full uh, extent of work order management, we have that available. Most people just want to get, you know, meet the legislative requirement. So what we'll do now is, of course, there's uh, information right here, but Aiden will jump in. Aiden, you ready to share your screen and show the uh, program in, in place? Yeah, no problem. Okay. Okay, let's get Aiden to be the presenter here. Uh, I think I just can go here and make you presenter. And here you go. There you go, Aiden. All right. Show my screen. So yes, can you see my screen stop? Yep, and you even got you on camera at the top. <laughs> right, I'm like, I'm like get rid of it. Well, whatever works. Uh, there. Move it. Yeah. Right. So, welcome everybody. So. I guess from my perspective, obviously um, we have retirement villages and aged cares in New South Wales, um, scattered all over the place. So I guess the latest one we built was in Penrith. We've got one in Dubbo, a couple in Wollongong, um, all are co-located, so retirement village aged care. Um, so as Scott said, we, we sort of went through the process of, of building this, I guess, looking forward to the New South Wales retirement village um, legislation that came in on the 1st of July. So a lot of this stuff I'll show you is tailored for that. But obviously we're very aware that the other states will come in soon. And as Scott said, those sort of, what we've developed here is easily customizable if the legislations in different states differ and different reporting is required. It's easy to sort of just flip it and manage it. Um, from my understanding, the, the next states in line are likely to be Victoria and Queensland with potentially Victoria being next. Um, time scales started next year, March, depending on elections and things like that. Um, so I guess it's good to get ahead of the game and start thinking about this and putting asset management in place. Similarly, I guess we also do aged care. So within our facilities, um, we have co-location. So we actually use this program for all our aged care. And where that's important is, um, where there's the retirement village legislation on one side and asset management plans on the other side, you obviously have accreditation and the quality standards. And quality standard five is, is organization service environment, which you have to basically make sure all your assets are safe, clean, maintained. Um, and this basically assists with that as well. So you can obviously make sure all your assets are maintained, have maintenance schedules, get, have res resident feedback and resident opinion on your assets, which is part of the um, accreditation quality standards. So it really attunes nicely to your aged care as well if you're co-located. Um, and we are actually looking at doing a separate aged care webinar because this one's very much retirement village, but we're going to look at an aged care webinar as well. So I guess what, um, what I'll take you through is this is what the face of asset journey looks like. Um, so as you'll see, you have your sort of options down the left-hand side and your options up at the top. And then in the middle, you have dashboards. And really what the dashboards are saying is, it's giving you all your assets. If you click on that, it actually goes through your assets. And as you're using it for your maintenance, it also tells you how many open tasks you've got and your overdue tasks. Underneath, you can do dashboards by, say, status. So if you had active and inactive assets, it would be more of a complex diagram there. Um, you can set departments. So as you can see, this is based on our village in Penrith, is what this demo site is based on. Um, and as you can see, we've got different assets. We've got 38 that are shared between aged care and village. We've got 21 village only, four aged care only, you know, and so you categorize it. We've got some in the hair salon there, for example. Um, and then you can have actually categories of appliances, computers, dishwashers. And underneath you have basically your asset register underneath, which you can have a look at. Um, so what I like to start off with and probably explain as well how we've just adapted normal asset management for retirement village and aged care purpose. Um, is adding an asset. And so just remembering that when you add an asset, when you, this is adding an asset as if I buy an asset today, per the legislation, you have to put it in within seven days. 
or in an age care world, you buy an asset and you put it in. Um, when you sign up with Asset Journey, you don't have to do this for every single asset. There is an import template where you put your assets in and all the required information per the legislation, um, which obviously, if you're doing an aged care and retirement, your retirement stuff of your items over $1,000 are going to have to have a lot more information because it has to be attuned with legislation, whereas your aged care side, you, it's probably a little bit less information. So really, add an asset, there's tabs up the top, so you never have to come off the one screen. Um, and basically, you add the information. So you basically have an asset type. So I'm just going to do, say, a dishwasher. Um, it gives it a title. You can give it a description if you want, if you want to do a different description. Um, asset condition. Um, so technically, asset condition is not part of the legislation. But however, when you look at, forget about legislation, aged care, any asset you actually want to have a look at, um, the asset condition is important because obviously when you run a report, you want to know the conditions. And where this is really important is when you, when part of the legislation is um, transparency around when you replace assets, dependent on useful life and how much you've repaired them in terms of cost versus purchase, which we'll go through later. And a big part of that conversation is the asset condition. Because as an example, you come to the useful, end of the useful life of your dishwasher, but it's in absolutely excellent condition. The, the Technically, the reports say, well, you should replace it. But then there's a conversation behind that of actually it's in excellent condition. Let's not replace it just yet. So that's where that becomes important. But again, not part of the legislation, but we've customized it to actually add that box because it's very, very handy. So reporting type. So we've built this in, which again is very New South Wales legislation based. And if this comes in in other states similarly, it will stay there. If it changes, it will be customized. But basically in New South Wales, the legislation now allows you to do individual items. You can group items and therefore you create groups. So you can see we've got like FY21 computers, FY21 dishwashers and the FY22 items. Knowing that there's specific rules about how you group. So basically to group, they have to be bought in the same financial year. Each item in the group is over a thousand dollars, which there is some confusion about that. People say, oh, the combined value is out, but it's actually each at each asset item in the group is over a thousand dollars and bought in the same financial year and have a similar useful life. They're the three rules. And if they pass all those three, you can group. And in general, in our villages, we've grouped things like that dishwashers, ovens, fridges, that sort of stuff by the year of purchase um, and construction items. So those sort of bigger building items or uh, sewerage system, fire systems, that sort of construction items you can do there. Um, again, a lot of your aged care stuff when you do it is generally individual because these sort of group and construction items don't exist really in the aged care world. It's more equipment, fittings, furniture, so it's generally individual. Your 10 year plan start date is 1st of July 2022 for most. If you've done that afterwards, then it's after. Um, you can give it an asset category. So here, this is customizable, so you can make whatever categories you want. Um, so I'm just going to say that's equipment. I'll say I've made a dishwasher one there. Status is always going to be active. Where this becomes important is, again, per the legislation, but even putting legislation aside just generally, um, when you obviously get rid of an asset, you have to make it inactive. Um, but also you have to actually say what you replaced it with and the cost of replacement, which I'll show you later. So active for now, you've got to have a make, model and serial number. Again, per legislation, you need to have this or as much as possible as you can go backwards. You can put links in here if you want to link it to other stuff you have on SharePoint or wherever you want. Barcode number is an example where we didn't originally have that and someone wanted to look at barcoding. And so we actually added that, which is relatively easy. Um, then going to location. So you can actually assign the asset to someone, which generally, you're not saying in our villages, we don't do, but you can assign the asset to a specific person or which generally would be stuff like computers, right? Um, location is twofold. So location, first section is where, where actually is the asset? So again, this is based on our Penrith, but you can actually customize building location room to whatever you want it to be. For example, you might you can use building location, you just got room. But ours is basically say building C, in building C you have a basement and six levels and a rooftop. So I might just say it's in level three. And then on level three, there's different IOUs. So let's just say it's 307. Might write that down so I can find something later. 
Well, similarly, let's say, say we've got level one, then we have all our sort of beauty salon, hair salon, honesty bar. So you set this up when you sign up to Asset Journey, you customize all this. Um, so I'll just go back to level three, three or seven. That's part one. In the aged care world, where that's important, just flip into sort of between the two, um, is location of asset. So what we find in our aged cares is the location of asset is very important. You have lifters and equipment that you move from level to level, room to room, building to building. And so this allows you to basically change where the location is so you never lose track of where your assets are. A big one for us is stuff like mattresses. Mattresses move from room to room to room. Um, very hard to track, especially if you've got purchased one versus you're hiring them. Um, so it gives you the ability to track location of items. So then the second part is department. And again, you can create a department. It doesn't have to be this, but this is per our village. And what this allows you to do is allocate a department. Where this is important is, again, this is New South Wales legislation, but you know, it turns to everywhere, is um, if you share an item over $1,000 with someone else, then you basically have to say who it's shared with and the percentage. So in a, not, in a village world, a lot of your items is just going to be village only, right? But in our, in our co-located worlds, there's some that's village age care. An example would be, say, we have a shuffleboard with the village play and the age care play, right? That'd be age care village. If you do choose age care village, then you can actually do the percentages. So in our world, RAC is residential age care. RVP is retirement village partnership in our world. We can call it whatever you want. So we're going to say it's 50% aged care, 50% village. And that tracks that and spits it through the reporting that you require. Um, similarly, you could have you could have stuff that's nothing to do with the aged care or village. So a lot of the stuff we, if there's alterations or a resident brings that own bridge or they bring their own blinds or something like that, you can actually make it resident owned because the, the variance of that is obviously, or in our world, not in everyone's world, is if they bring their own items in, it's actually their responsibility to repair and maintain, not ours. And so that gives a nice tracking mechanism to do that. Well, I'll leave it as aged care village for now. Then you, you sort of go onto the finance tab and that's your very financial stuff that I love. It's when you bought it. So let's just say we bought it a couple of years ago. And the purchase price is obviously over a thousand dollars. Effective life, so again, the New South Wales Retirement Village, and I don't imagine this changing across the other states, um, but obviously aged care you need to have a look at. Um, you need to pick up the effective life from the ATO tables part B of effective lives and basically put whatever's there in here. Um, where that differs if you, is if you really have an asset that is not a standard asset and we might be able to extend that, but it's eight years for a dishwasher. Um, you have to have a proposed date of capital placement, which is basically purchase date plus effective life equals. And that becomes important later on. Um, just flipping back to where I said active, inactive. So where you make an asset inactive, it's just important to put the actual cost of replacement and when you replaced it. And again, that's a, that's a reporting thing for retirement village legislation. But I guess it just shows you the, the level of detail we've actually went through in terms of the software package versus legislation, it just aligns um, so that you know you're compliant, I guess, if you if you do have audits. Um, what we're finding is, especially our clients, uh, I think a good few of them have been audited. Some are still going through the audit. Um, others have passed, basically, um, and using the, the, the reports that come out of our system, they've passed. Um, so you move on to the maintenance tab. This is where it gets interesting so again the new south wales retirement legislation there's a couple of things that need to happen again it will probably be extended to the other states whether it's the same level of detail not sure but obviously customizable so what do you have to have so every asset over a thousand dollars you need to have basically a 10-year maintenance plan and a 10-year repair plan so part of it is i guess when you look at preventative maintenance or maintenance in the legislation terminology is basically to me that means you're contracted preventative maintenance right so you could argue say in my example i'm doing here which is actually 100 percent aligned to what we do in our village we don't have preventative maintenance of dishwashers so actually this would be zero for us but just imagine we do okay 
Um, and the person, the guy comes out and looks at the dishwashers and it's $200 per one or $150. So you'd put 150, you add CPI, whatever CPI would be, and you do it for your, essentially eight years, whatever it might be. Um, but you get the picture. So you sort of do your eight year plan of the 10 years. Um, and what it does down here is it totals it and it gives you a share between aged care and retirement. Because um, you're doing preventative maintenance, you can actually say the frequency. So we're going to do it annually, for example. Then you, you can say what quotes you obtained. That, this is an important part for um, the, so you have to have a couple of reports, a 10 year report, a three year report, which goes out with your budget. Part of the three year report is obviously you, you actually say what sort of quotes you got. So you can actually put your quotes in here. Bought this a dishwasher um, ASCO maintenance quote. Um, then your repairs 10 year plan, which is the, the interesting one, because I guess you have to have a four, 10 year forecast for ad hoc repairs that you, you obviously don't foresee essentially. So a dishwasher, you might say, okay, well, you might have to do something every three years 200, 200, 200. Again, it shows, so this is basically, what I'm creating here is your 10 year plan for that asset. But again, when you sign up, all this information is in the import template. So you're basically filling it out in your Excel template and it's all there and aligned. So then when you've done it, you can play with it and play with it, make sure the totals match and it looks reasonable. Because I guess where it's really getting to is the three year, the first three years, and obviously the corresponding three years as you move in time, it could be very important because it goes as part of your as part of your budget. So you just want to make sure that I guess saying in this world, year one preventative maintenance basically matches your budget at the relevant percentage. Your repairs are covered in your budget, but your budget should actually be more because your budget would include repairs of assets less than a thousand dollars as well. So it's just thinking through those things. And I guess we that's why being an operator is good because we think we've thought through those things about how this affects budgets and residents and things like that. So pretty much, right, you can add an image if you want and related items, you can assign a contract to it, which is down here on the left. You can add contracts and put manuals and warranties in so you can track all that stuff. Um, pretty much that's adding an asset. So once I've done that, that is now in my asset register. It has a 10 year plan, the three year report items are sorted um, and away you go with that asset, right? Similarly, in your assets, you can search assets and look at all your assets, so, and that's all exportable to Excel. So you can sort of just download whatever, say, this list here, you can export it to Excel, and as you can see, you can move it around, so very customizable. You can um, filter by whatever you want to filter, asset IDs, and then it will bring things to the top or the bottom. Um, you can sort them. So I guess that's sort of the first part. And again, for us, um, in our co-located sites, forget about, I guess, retirement village legislation is that's over $1,000. We've actually got all our retirement village stuff in there, whether it be over or less than $1,000. We have all our aged care items in there so that we're consistently looking at our asset base, but also the maintenance and repair of all those assets to align with village legislation and aged care quality standards. That's sort of how we use it. So then the second part, and again, what does the legislation in New South Wales say? It basically says every time you maintain and repair an asset over $1,000, you need to basically track certain information about that and have a live report available to residents at all times. Flip that for the aged care side, very similar. Quality standards says you need to basically maintain your assets to a certain standard and you need to basically have scheduled maintenance and track it. So it's a very similar report, I guess, that can be used for both. So maintenance tasks, so there's two ways of doing this. Um, you can actually go and click on maintenance tasks. Um, and there's some here that we've seen. So there's actually a list here of completed them all, which is great. Um, if they weren't all completed, they'd be in different statuses here. Um, so there's two ways of using this. Some clients just use it for compliance, i.e. they only have assets over a thousand dollars in there. When they maintain and repair those assets, they just directly put it in here and they don't really use it as a maintenance tool on the ground. 
um, in our facilities and a lot of our other clients actually use this as a maintenance tool. So they actually use this as a workflow that a maintenance task is created that is assigned to your maintenance person, they complete the job, and then basically you put a costing in, and then that's the end of the maintenance task, which then speaks through to your reporting and makes you compliant. Um, how did that happen? So you basically add a new maintenance task. Um, <laughs> um, so what happens, so you can imagine that there's a couple of ways this could happen. Um, your staff see something and want to enter this. Uh, the maintenance team see something and they go around, they have the iPads with Asset Journey on and can just easily put it in. Um, the residents obviously request the repair um, or just another general ad hoc, right, that someone, a staff member sees. Um, so in our village, for example, there's they would come down to the concierge and fill in a maintenance slip. That maintenance slip gets put in Asset Journey in the screen we're looking at now. Um, Similarly, we're, we, we are looking at developing the resident being able to directly put maintenance requests into a portal. They wouldn't actually go in this because it's a bit complex, in a portal which feeds through. Um, and we also have just had a partnership with Compago, which basically does that. They have a resident database app, which then feeds through to our system. But let's just say it fix the door. I've done that before, even though it's in capitals. Um, is it preventative or reactive? Let's say it's reactive. And again, your preventative should be very aligned to your contracts. So your preventative um, should be part of your maintenance schedules, which I'll go through later. Um, so in a workflow world, you would say fixed or reactive. Uh, the start date is essentially the date that the request got put in. Then our team basically managed the due date. So they're gonna give it seven days. Completed date will stay blank for now because we haven't started it. We assign it to our maintenance man or our operations person. You can assign it to two people so you can multi track it. Um, if it's an external, so sometimes obviously, if, or most of the time, your preventative maintenance is an external supplier. So you can actually um, put in, say, who's it going to be? None of them, but let's just say it's them. It pulls your supplier email from, so on the left, you'll notice suppliers here. And suppliers in our world, it suppliers stroke contractors. In this, you would have all your contractor list with email and phone number. Um, and so if you are using a external, so you can put it in here and you can, can basically have a basic workflow, which basically sends out a work order, essentially. If you actually want to go further than that, it's the basic, there is a work order add-on system, which Scott was talking about earlier on, which is a very much def more defined and detailed work order management system of like putting in times and parts and tracking and you basically workflow whatever you want. So right now the task would be not started because we haven't started it. Um, you would say where the maintenance is. So let's just say it's building C, level three, 307. And you can see the dishwasher I just added there. So you add what the asset is. You can put some commentary in. Um, is it an, let's see, this door does not close. Um, so you can put a description and basically you save it, which I won't do right now, but you save it, it goes into your list, then you go through your process. What happens after that? Obviously, it goes through the stages. So when a maintenance guy starts it, it goes into in progress. Then you can complete it or defer it or wait on someone else. So say it all goes swimmingly, he completes it. Then it basically, in our world, it basically stays in this status until we get the invoice and then we put the amount in and you save it. Completed date and the completed date. Don't forget the completed date. You save it, then that actually, that's here, but it also flows through to your legislative reports and shows that what you've done to that dishwasher. So that's sort of how we use it. There is a more just compliance version where you basically just fill in the whole thing in one go and you put it's completed put the costs in save it and it goes through to your reports so that's sort of one side of well that's the main side of maintenance but also using it as a tool within your business to actually do maintenance and as i said we do that in all our villages so it works quite nicely in terms of the reporting as well so we're able to we have a weekly meeting um, on a tuesday where we actually 
do an export from this system of all the outstanding jobs by date. So we can go through, okay, well, why are these two months old? What's happening with the ones that are one month old? So we can really make sure nothing gets lost in the system. Um, so that's it. There is another way of doing a maintenance, which I might just show you. So that's one way. The other way is, and if I just scroll down, I don't know where it's going to be. Probably at the end. So this is the dishwasher I just added. So the other way of doing a maintenance is actually through your through the asset. So you can actually go directly into an asset, um, go to the maintenance tab, and there's a section here. It basically says preventative maintenance task, reactive maintenance task. So as you can see, that one we just did is already there. So it's all linked, right? So you can at any time go into any asset and see what maintenance you've done to it, what repairs have happened historically. So I guess you can, for whatever reason, whether it be from a resident request or an accreditation purpose, you can see exactly what's happened in terms of each asset. Um, but similarly, you click on add new task, comes to the same screen. That could do it through here if you want to do it through here. Um, where the, um, so that's fine. So oh, the other bit is um, part of the legislation, but this is a good thing anyway, I think, is um, when as part of the tracking of useful life and replacement of assets, and part of that reporting you have to do for New South Wales purposes is you have to track total repairs versus purchase costs. When that hits 90%, you basically need to make a, re um, a replace or maintain decision. So in, in a New South Wales legislation world, yeah, okay, we've got to do that for legislation purposes and it's on the reports. But even for your assets under $1,000, your aged care, other, any other assets is actually a good tool to have that you're actually tracking this stuff so that you can make strategic decisions on your assets and when you replace them or not replace them. And this is also where your asset condition comes into play as discussed earlier, of whether it's good, excellent or poor condition. So you can see here, so far I've spent $200 on this repairing it, it's split between aged care, but it's basically 10% of the purchase cost. So when that's hits 90%, it actually goes onto a separate report and you actually have to say maintain or replace here. And if you're gonna maintain it or whatever, just for excellent condition, never, I guess, in storage for, Three years, whatever it might be, right? Um, and also, you can start looking at this stuff before it gets night. Have a look at it when it gets to sixty percent, so that you can really be ahead of the conversations. Um, so I can save that. So that's sort of your assets and your maintenance tasks. So where does that lead us? So I might just come to the resident feedback. Scott mentioned that earlier on. So. Your six, there's a 60 day feedback period when you set when you do your asset registers that any resident can basically give feedback. You have to basically take that feedback on, record it, and say whether you change the asset management plans for that feedback and why or why not. Basically, that's what this does. So you can add new. And that's what it does. You send the title, who put it in, what their building location room is, the commentary. Um, when, it was, when the comment came in, was the AMP revised or not, yes or no, and it tracks all that stuff. <laughs> Similarly, a very similar feedback form can be used for your aged care side if you have aged care, um, because part of those quality standards is that obviously residents can put in their opinions about your fixtures, furniture and equipment, and you have to record that and say that obviously you've looked into it and, and basically provided communications back to the resident. So that's just an aged care flip on this. Um, so outside of that, we'll come to reporting. I've got about 19 minutes left, so I'm doing good for time, I think. So reporting. So there's two reporting tabs, your report centre and required reports. What does required reports really mean? Basically, it means your legislative reports for retirement. Right? So you have your asset register, 
your maintenance schedule estimated, which is your 10 year report, your maintenance schedule actual, which is that report of the tracker of all your actual maintenance and repairs. Um, you have your three year report, which is the three year version of the 10 year report, knowing that your three year report is the one you have to give out with your budget every year. As part of that three year report, you also have to run these two, which basically separates any items with a year or less of effective life. Any, any items where the repairs is greater than 90% of purchase price. So again, that's those two are assets are separated because you have to make the maintain replace decision and obviously say why or why not. Um, and those three reports go out with your budget. Um, so that's all, and again, so all these have been created specifically for retirement village, villages. Obviously the other states, Queensland, Victoria, South Australia are probably gonna be coming next. If there are nuances and differences to these reports, they'll be amended to reflect, basically. Um, so I might just run one, hoping this shows up. So retirement village name, this is all preset when you, when you sign up. Date plan created, this is the 10 year. So this, this asset register where it becomes only in COVID items over. If you're just being legislative, you'd put $1,000 in there. Obviously, you could leave it blank or zero and it'll have all your assets in there. Um, so I can generate the report. It comes through to Excel. So I'm just going to open that file. I'm hoping you can still see this when it opens the Excel. So this is our asset register here. So it gives a little title and little header there. So you know you can track all that stuff. And again, it's a what of it track, and this is all very legislative. So in the legislation, if you actually read through it, all these items are required to be reported on. So it completely aligns. But in a similar sense, even if you're not talking about retirement villages, this sort of asset register is very handy to have for any of your assets. Um, so it has to have an asset ID number. I'm gonna make this bigger. Um, description, uh, where it is, the brand and serial, when it was purchased, how much it was purchased for, the effective life, the remaining effective life, based on the time that's been spent. Um, if it's shared, who is it shared with? So you can see this one's shared with aged care, but this, this one's blank, so it's village only. If it's shared, the percentage applicable. So that is all tracked. Again, all required. As you can see, for any industry, it's good to have this information anyway. Then you go down and you have your grouped items. So if you remember I said you can group items and all that really does is, and just for clarity, if you group an item, it's still in the system as an individual item, which can be repaired and maintained individually. So if you have a hundred dishwashers, there's a hundred dishwashers individually in the system, but for reporting purposes, they're grouped. So you can see here, the total of my computers is 10,000, it was bought in F by 23, the effective life is 10, Remaining effect is actually higher because of the FY23. Um, if it's shared and the percentage, and then you're similarly you're building the structures. So we have fire stairs here, for example. It's definitely not in the archive room, but that's okay. When it was completed, um, cost of construction, effective life will go in there, remaining. So it's just doing your construction items. But that's essentially your asset register. So I might just come out of that, go back to my required reports. Um, so I might go through the 10 year report because that's the, probably the most complex one of the legislation. So similar reporting stuff here, you're only doing assets over $1,000. Um, generate detailed report, which is the detailed one required. Uh, so you can open the file. And so this is unfortunately what the amount of detail that is required for the legislation. And similarly, so I'll make this bigger. What does it say? It basically say what the asset is. Um, then the first section is, and this is all, this has been actually been amended since, so you can see all this stuff. Um, what's the 10 year plan for maintenance? So you can just go to a more relevant one, say a Bosch washer. It's $100 up by CPI for your 10 years. Then it totals it. So here you have the total. Uh, proposed frequency of maintenance is annually. Type of maintenance. Again, this is per the legislation. You have to have type of maintenance, but really your preventive is just cyclical. Or, you know, so we just put cyclical in there. Um, if you're not talking about 
legislation and finance, you might even just remove that column. And what's your repair plan? Your repair plan for your 10 years, 50, 55. So again, this is all in the import templates. So you basically fill this out and it imports. Your total of your repairs, the date of the proposed repairs, who knows, we've got ad hoc repairs, but you need that further legislation. Um, description of repairs, you don't really know that yet, so we've got ad hoc. If it's shared, the percentage applicable, and then if you remember back to the finance screen, you have to put a proposed date of replacement in there. That's what that is. Um, and when you sign up, we're very just very conscious that obviously you have villages that are a lot older. So they generally have some assets that are already past their useful life. So it's just making sure that this is updated to be a date in the future, essentially, if you're not replacing. Um, very similarly, underneath this, you have your group items with the same information construction items with the same information. So I'll come out of that report, um, required reports. So then outside of that, so the three-year report is basically what I just showed you, it's just three years. Um, your three-year report, I'll just give you an example of this one. Um, and it's very similar to the other one, 90% of repairs. Um, there should be stuff on here, generate report. And what this is doing is for your three report is specifically pulling out items where you need to make that maintain or replace decision. Because in, a, in reality, that's what the residents are actually interested in. Um, so it tells me here that, yeah, my fire stairs are probably wrong because I should have got an effective life. And my melee, melee oven is minus 3.9 years. So that's four years past useful life. Um, I'm proposing or maintaining it, nothing in year one, two, three. Um, proposed repairs, yep, $100 a year. If And then right at the end, you have a maintain or replace decision. So you can either maintain it or replace it. And then, oh, I didn't enable anything. So you can have maintain or replace. And again, you can actually put this directly in the system so it flows through. But that's, I guess, the items that we're looking at. And again, from a forget about legislation, just from a general asset management, these two reports are very handy because it basically lets you plan on what you're doing with your assets in terms of maintaining or highlighting items that just cost a lot of money repairing and obviously just need to be replaced. Um, similarly, your maintenance schedule actual, again, so just, go, just to go back to put it into perspective. So when you, with your asset management plans, you obviously have to get them audited. So when you first put your asset management plans, what you're putting out, you're actually putting out your asset register and your 10 year plan. That's what is audited. Um, that's the, they're the items you put out in your village that you have a 60 day feedback period and can be viewed by a resident at any time. As an example, we actually have a hard copy down at our concierge, but obviously we also have digital copies. Um, your three year report ones go out with your budget every year. Your maintenance schedule actual is actually a separate report that a resident can request at any time, um, but doesn't form part of obviously your first initial report, so your AMPs, because it's more on ongoing compliance. So what I might do is put a thousand dollars in there, generate report. And so what this is doing, and again, this is all very legislative, the, all the headings exactly match the legislation. Um, is tracking what the ID number is, what the asset is, whether it's reactive or preventative. If it's preventative, it's the first section. So you can see preventative here. So where it's blank, that obviously means it's reactive. The preventative basically, so far we've spent, so actual cost of maintenance for this um, Fisher and Paykel fridge is $100. Um, and it's done task one. And then it accumulates it. So, so far it's been $100 and it's 6%. But then obviously it's broken down again, another $250. So now the accumulator is $350 and it's at 23%. So as you can see, this report does it individually, which you need to do, but it also accumulates it for your 90% rule. Uh, similarly, you go over to your repair section, reactive. Similarly, you have your actual, the actual data was carried out description of repairs, and then the actual accumulated. Um, so you can see here, for example, this one's at 92%. So 
that's going to be part of that separate report, which you're going to have to make, maintain, replace. Um, actual data replacement is the inactive ones that are replaced. So again, it's all just, I guess, legislatively, it makes you compliant, right? And it's a live report any time a resident requests it, that tracks all your maintenance repairs of the assets over $1,000. Taking that to the side, this is actually a very handy report for aged care purposes and general purposes, for decision-making purposes, and just tracking as a business what's actually happening in terms of maintenance. That's your reports. And I'll quickly run on to other reports. It's a report center. So there are some more standard reports in here. So you can check your assets by department. If you actually click on this, it goes through. The asset by location. So you can see we've got different levels here. Um, Asset by status, so all ours are active, but if there's inactive, they'll be inactive. Now, where we use where we use in our weekly meetings is open tasks by month, which obviously, as you can see from my maintenance one, they're all completed. But if they are open, they actually have graphs here of how old they are by month. And so straight away we bring this graph up and go, right, let's check in the ones that are from June and what's going on with them. Similarly, you have tasks by staff and who's doing what, and tasks by status. So again, you can we use this one as well because this will give a pie chart of completed versus not completed. And then we basically click on the not completed and review it. And task by type, so you have preventative versus reactive, essentially. So that's your report center. Um, so in terms of showing you, I guess, the basics, or maybe not the basics, um, that's pretty much it, right? So I guess what I would say is, a good way if you're interested is actually set up a demo because then we can obviously we wouldn't have to go through all this again but can um, but it's more getting to know your village or aged care or both um, and trying to work and trying to see how it fits with your village so it works with your processes so having like an individual demo where, you, where as well you guys can ask questions and feel free to put questions through on this i think you can um, about whether it even be about legislation or whatever how it works um, and we can talk through that. Um, so I said, yeah, that's that's a, a good next step if you want to have a further chat. Um, similarly, for I guess if you go on our website, there is a video on there you can have a look at, um, and data sheets. Um, there's a retirement village one there. There's about to be an aged care one released, so you can look at that. There's a data sheet on there. Um, if for those of you who are in aged care, if you are going to the national conference in Adelaide, we're actually exhibiting there. So you can come over and see us. Um, and I think that's about it. So I think, yeah, for me, it's more, obviously New South Wales is in. I think Victoria and Queensland will be next, um, along with other states. So it's good to get on board, as well as looking at your age care, if you're co-located, you'd actually get a bit of additional benefit from this beyond what New South Wales legislation is, is telling us we have to do and get added benefit rather than it just being a compliance and cost burden. Um, and yeah, look, I guess, tend to send me an email, send me a text or give me a call and I'll be happy to chat to any of you further um, with a demo or any other means. Yeah, very good, Aiden. that's absolutely right. We hope to hear from people on uh, you know, on the call and uh, I'm presenting my screen again. Am I presenting my screen again? I don't know. I was gonna try and show the monitor too, yeah. Is that show and monitor too, just the contact info? All right. Well, thank everyone for attending. And uh, we, we will follow up uh, with the people, with you guys. And uh, let us know if this is something that is of interest. And Aiden, that was a good good demonstration of the ins and outs of Asset Journey. You see there's a lot to it. And uh, we covered a lot of the bases. It's not only for the legislation mandates, but it's also for the uh, just better operations altogether and the efficient operation of it, right? Correct. And yeah, there's no questions that come through, but if you want to write any last minute questions, I'm still happy to answer them. If not, then um, give me a call or I'm happy to have a chat about asset journey or anything else legislative. I don't know yeah, it. it's not a, probably not the most pleasant subject, but it's, it's something that has to be done, right? Right, David? Okay. All right. Well, everyone well, take care. Thank you. We'll, have, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks again for attending. Thank you, Aiden. Okay. Thanks. Bye.